Um, good evening, everybody, and welcome. This is quite exciting. Um, the Festival of Urbanism for 2022. I'm Elizabeth Farrelly, and it's my pleasure to be chairing this Festival of Urbanism event entitled, as I'm sure you know, Saving Sydney. I'm a columnist, critic, um, essayist, former independent city of Sydney councillor, um, and, and uh, current writer in residence at the Henry Halloran Trust, um, the University of Sydney. Before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge the, uh, and pay respect to the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, traditional owners of the land on which we meet. It's upon their ancestral lands that the University of Sydney is built. As we share our own knowledge and research practices within this university, we also pay tribute to the knowledge embedded forever within the Aboriginal custodianship of this country. And as we embark upon a discussion of city as home, it seems appropriate, or perhaps especially appropriate to me, that we acknowledge indigenous ideas of sacred space. The idea for this event, Saving Sydney, evolved as a kind of riposte, in a way, to my mo most recent book, Killing Sydney, The Fight for a City's Soul. Kin Killing Sydney is a sort of broken-hearted love song about the way we've betrayed the intrinsic beauty of this place in its fabric, as well as its natural setting. We hope that tonight's Saving Sydney discussion will germinate a new set of ideas to remedy some of that destruction and set about uh, putting Sydney on a new and more positive path for the future. We have a great panel of speakers for you. During the first half of this session, uh, we'll hear from each of our panelists in turn before moving to some audience Q&A. Uh, I'm going to be fairly military about time control uh, under strict instructions. Um, but look, thank you to everybody who's already sent in questions for our panel. We'll, if, uh, if and when we uh, have time, we will have um, some of those. We'll also have a roving mic for audience questions after the speakers. So, let me first very briefly introduce our very distinguished panel. I'm going to summarise everybody in about half a sentence when they each deserve at least a paragraph or two. Um, Michael Rodriguez at the far end is New South Wales' first 24-hour uh, economy commissioner and founding editor of Time Out Australia. Uh, Kerry Glassick, Glasscock, I'm sorry, is CEO and festival director of Sydney Fringe Festival um, and a leading advocate for uh, the arts in Sydney and for their critical role in creating an uh, interesting and energising city. Professor Chris Gibson, uh, his research covers an extraordinary range of <laughs> subjects, um, which is wonderful. I, sh I think there should be more of that. Um, the future of industrial regions and geographies of urban creativity, and also music and all kinds of other interesting bits of urban, uh, the urban jigsaw. Uh, Dr. Lyndall Hugo is an agricultural scientist and sustainable food entre entrepreneur who founded a company called Orla, a zero pesticide, ultra sustainable, socially minded food company in Ho Chi Minh City in Vietnam. Uh, Professor Michelle Leishman is Director of Smart Green Cities at Macquarie University, and Philip Fallis, Founding Principal of Hill Fallis Architecture and Urban Projects, um, and former, also former Independent Councillor for the City of Sydney. So, uh, it, first question then is for Michael. Uh, you've said, and I paraphrase here a little bit, the couch is my enemy. Um, I don't, I think this is a bit that's slightly paraphrased, I don't care whether it's the beach or the opera, just get out there. Clearly, our world's biggest houses, with pools and home theatres and so on, militate against that just getting out there impulse. There's a sort of inverse relationship, arguably, between house size and community engagement. So. My question for you is, in, in futuring Sydney, I've invented a, a new verb there, do we need to limit house size, do you well, think? Well, I, th I think it's a, <laughs> um, it's a consideration, and um, 
one that policymakers everywhere can fight over, really. Like, uh, um, it's a, there is a correlation, I think, and if, oftentimes people look at uh, Sydney in comparison to London, New York, and one thing that you can identify there is that in Sydney, um, it's a real estate driven market uh, for many people and uh, it's sort of sprawled out across uh, a, a great territory now and uh, it seem, it's seemingly boundless uh, is, is the rate of development. Um, mm. So uh, it, it and, and, and I think that so much emphasis then goes into uh, an investment in, uh, in your dwelling and then uh, the best businesses of the world uh, know how to make advantage of that which is um, the magnetic pool and two <laughs> clicks to stay in and how many clicks does it take to go out. So uh, I, I, I'm not here to recommend everyone downsize. Um, <laughs> but uh, um, I, I guess partly the, the role for, for me is, is reminding people of what a great city we have and you know, really uh, and an acknowledging country myself, it's a, a role f across the aura. And if you look at Sydney as a city, one thing it, you can say is that it's, uh, it, it's blessed with amazing um, uh, topography Mm. Uh, from beaches through the mountains. It's uh, the longest continuing culture on the planet. And it's also the most multicultural city on, in the world. So there's three ingredients for really rich storytelling. And I think that the bit that we tend to focus on, maybe or maybe a little bit too much, is y y you know the, the area that's sort of five kilometres from where we're sitting tonight. And uh, it sometimes belies the wealth of culture and storytelling and, uh, and excitement that does exist further afield. Uh, and one thing about culture is that it's like water. It, it finds a way to trickle um, through. Right? You can't. And, and uh, it's interesting in that um, in growing up in Liverpool, which was not home to uh, an Indian community when I grew up there, but as the Indian, Fijian Indians moved in, you know, there was a perfectly good car park never designed for cultural purposes that was taken over for Diwali. And so my point is that it's, um, it's a simplification, Elizabeth, to say smaller dwelling sizes lead to a vibrant city. Um, but uh, I think that one must uh, look at that in context of, of many other things and think how much do you value on community? And that's what the pandemic has shown us. We value coming out. So thank you to each and every one of you. And, the, <laughs> and, and to the people that are sitting at home, if there is a crowd vote, if you're on the couch, I'm not that, you know, <laughs> please also take that into consideration and welcome to you as well. <laughs> so just actually just a quick follow-up question. Do you think, so it, it seems to me that in trying to encourage a 24-hour economy across the metropolis, you can either, you can either try and pull people into the city centre, which I imagine you're trying to do at the moment in particular, because the city centre's a bit... Uh, um, or you can try and take some of the energy from the city centre, cultural energy, I guess, um, and institutional energy, perhaps, into um, some of the peripheral areas. Which of those is the better approach? Or well, the third, which is to recognise that cultural energy exists in other places, not just in the city centre. Yes. Um, so, and uh, to encourage that in some Correct, way. right. Yeah. So if you think about it in this way, and I'm conscious of some of my panellists here, and uh, in trying to explain this to uh, many rooms over the brief time I've been in my role, only 18 months now, there's a neon grid idea, which is how Sydney lights up at day and night with different stories across that great topography, um, without making any comment on uh, renewable energy. But if you imagine, <laughs> for example, uh, if you had a power plant in Sydney and you're transferring, as is the case, electricity from one spot all across 50 kilometres out, there is a loss of power along mm. the way. Mm. If you have individual cells of energy all across the city, other people can explain why that is a more efficient and a more um, self-generating uh, uh, and sustainable model. And so the point of this is to say that Howden Street, Lakemba is an opportunity to mm. energise a city. Harris Park with Wigan Road is an opportunity to, re to, to energise the city. Now, that may mean that uh, those of us who have large houses and like everything being on our doorstep and understanding that while we have located for the time being uh, a lot of infrastructure, both cultural and transport in a very small area, very close to here, um, there are um, equally exciting things elsewhere mm -hmm. and you know what, go and see it. And we're, we're, we're connecting the city through transport that's the other area of government, but as the metro follows and all the rest of it, there is 
outside of the sustainability arguments I'm sure other people talk about, there is the opportunity to move around, hopefully in a more um, convenient way. Transport's a major issue. Um, <laughs> so I think that uh, it's a bit of both and, you know, there's some amazing things on in the city. I know uh, Kerry's been busy with Fringe, for example. Um, and the, 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 like, yes, this weekend you've had um, two major sporting fixtures at the stadium and people will travel for stuff they want. Mm. Um, that's the thing that we're rem being reminded of right now. Um, so, you know, if you've got a compelling offer and it's appropriately priced and it's accessible and it reaches people, mm. you know, you're, you're putting yourself in a good position to attract them to it. Mm. I like that image of a, a distributed grid of culture. Um, so that actually leads quite nicely into Kerry, Kerry's work with um, French Festival. So my question really for you, Kerry, is just um, to describe, if you can, what it is that festivals like the Fringe can contribute to the kind of greater life of Sydney, our city like Sydney. Yeah, well, I mean, I suppose starting at Fringe, Fringe is unique in that it's very different to the other festivals that happen in Sydney. So we're not a top-down exercise where we're importing a whole bunch of activity that's not from Sydney and we're overlaying it on top of the city at the cost of our businesses or our other cultural activity. We're a ground-up organisation that was started by the community for the community. So what we do really is highlight and identify fantastic pockets of cultural activity, be they out of the CBD or in the CBD, provide support and amplify that offering on top of that. Um, so really Sydney Fringe is Sydney's festival. Mm -hmm. Um, it's not the Sydney Festival, but it's, we always like to say we'd love that one to be called Sydney's International Festival and we would be Sydney's Festival because we're about local artists, local venues and local activity. Um, and I suppose really it leads quite nicely on from what Mike was saying, which is festivals offer, when they're done authentically, where they're connected to community and they are organically grown within their community, for their community, they provide an opportunity to promote and amplify that cultural activity and to support uh, voices that don't necessarily get heard in other festival contexts or on other stages. And that's a really big part of what Sydney Fringe does. So 80 to 90% of our artists are emerging and first-time artists and almost cool. all of the artists that participate in Fringe don't get to participate in any other venues at any time of the year. And this is because we have a limited amount of venues in Sydney. <laughs> We know we've had a venue crisis for many, many years. We build each year about 30 temporary venues to accommodate um, the demand from the sector. But also all of the venues that we do have year round in Sydney are curated or they have some type of curatorial overlay on top of them, which means it excludes a lot of voices. Mm. So it excludes diversity of voices. Um, it excludes voices from marginal communities or who don't necessarily have access to that type of network or space or the reach or audience um, that they need. Um, so they're very, very important to community uh, projects like Fringe because they really are um, the true voice of what Sydney is. And then we utilise the data that we gather during fringe each year to take a snapshot of the health of the whole sector and to then drive other projects that we run with government or with private sector partners to really um, drive either regulatory or policy reform or to, um, uh, to, to drive projects for more sustainable practice. So we need lots of small venues in particular, small unprogrammed venues, is that...? Yeah, we need yeah. Uh, accessible, affordable... Yeah. appropriate spaces. Mm. So a lot of the work we do during festival time and year round is around um, education of what that is, what is an art space, of, of changing the dial that it doesn't have to be a 2,000 seat fully fixed mm. theatre or a gallery like this. It can just be a concrete shell with some power and water. <laughs> really that's all it needs to be. Mm. Um, a lot of the work we do is around identifying those spaces and supporters of, um, of space, either landowners or property developers of how we can access that space and making connections for cultural community to use that space. Mm. Yeah, and, and then identifying and eliminating any regulatory barriers that might prohibit that activity. Yeah. Of which there's been a lot <laughs> in Sydney, yeah. but not so many anymore. <laughs> um, that's lovely. I love that idea of lots of little things happening all over the place. I, I um, wonder whether... You, I mean, I'm sure you've thought of doing, you know, funny little events in funny little pockets all over the place. Um, which yeah. actually kind of segues to my question to Chris, um, who 
uh, the last time we spoke, in fact, the only time we spoke, you said you used that lovely phrase, pockets of joy in a city. And I think you said something about, um, uh, for example, unsolicited bids in Sydney, which have been such a nightmare in planning, uh, which produce things like the casino, obviously. Um, but, but I think you were, were blaming such unsolicited bids for the destruction of Sydney's pockets of joy, which I think is a really interesting... Uh, thought. So it's not just about you know, the unfair use of public waterfront land, which is bad enough, but also this destruction of particular spaces. So do you want to talk a wee bit more about that? I think that's a really interesting idea. Yeah, sure. So um, for my sins, I am both a musician and a geographer, so I can <laughs> inspire you or bore you in equal combination. But um, we use a variety of mapping methods in our research um, where we interview people um, depending on the project and we've had a lot of projects which have been interviewing creative workers um, and so we get to ask them about their lives, their livelihoods, the spaces they use, whether they create at home, whether they access unusual venues or feel locked out of, of traditional venues, the rehearsal spaces, the dirty noisy industrial um, warehouses that, that have been reoccupied um, since the big manufacturers have gone but have now been predominantly housing this kind of really interesting kind of eclectic mix. Um, and we can put that information together basically in a map format where you can see things on a map and you can hear people talking about them and so forth. One of the things we really like about doing that kind of research is it brings to light and makes visible that which a planner or a big data system of analysis can't reveal. And that is the actual stories and connections that people have to their places, whether it's their backyard, their home studio, their you know, the, the dirty workshop down at the bottom of the street that has a car yard but also a sculptor next door and those sorts of things. Um, and unfortunately, one of the things that we've encountered in the work, which has often become, without us trying, quite controversial because we've been providing evidence about some of these pockets of joy in places that are destined to be redeveloped into pretty bland and pretty major developments, and that kind of is a hiccup in the, in the development system. Um, We've, uh, we've really discovered that there's a kind of lack of sense of sensitivity, if you like, to the grassroots, to the ground, to what's on the ground. So increasingly, the planning system, the way in which things like unsolicited bids work, they're guided from the view from above. It's as if the, there is a kind of, you know, um, a kind of plan for a, a precinct of the city, which doesn't really take account of what's actually happening on the ground. And so um, a lot of those, it was really quite shocking in one case where we were providing advice to the New South Wales government and realising that not a single study had been done actually in a precinct which was due to be redeveloped with a really substantial $1.6 billion redevelopment. The modelling on the employment impacts, which was the closest thing that came to it, was done as a desktop study looking at floor space ratios, the amount of employment that's generated from industrial land as opposed to commercial land, and then it's modelled upwards from that to suggest that X amount of jobs would be displaced or gained through the, you know, this particular project going ahead. Nobody had invested in actually hitting the ground and talking to the people in those factories or workshops or venues or whatever it is. So I think there's a kind of an issue here actually about forms of expertise and what kinds of knowledge actually flow into the decision making process in the city. So there's a kind of a hidden story here about the tragedy of Sydney but also the joys of Sydney and it's in, it's in process actually. Mm. Uh, and we'll, how do we actually find ways to, to get that sense of joy or uh, you know, pleasure that people have in often quite mundane places, in main streets across Western Sydney, for example? How do you actually capture that and, and factor that into the city's future? I think that's a, a you know, it's, we could debate that, but that's a really critical issue for the future. Mm. Someone, someone told me off actually online for, um, for there not being any planners on this panel. Uh, but I think, um, I mean, I probably said something a bit rude in response, but uh, it seems to me that planners find it very difficult to do the, that pocket thing, to, to allow things like that to happen in a way that's not, as Kerry might say, sort of programmed and organised and curated. Um, uh, actually, in my book, I invented, I thought I invented this word pocketedness, which seems to me the kind of key characteristic of a good city. Um, but also, just wanted to mention, I'm sure you know, but maybe not everyone does, that r wonderful uh, Rebecca Solnit project on mapping cities, and she did, I think it was the San Francisco one I was looking at, but this is sort of, it's, a, it's almost cognitive mapping, but it's sort of a bit more real than that, yeah. it's great. If you get a chance, have a look at the books, yeah. they're terrific. Um, and look, lots yeah. of social media use. I mean, people are actually following, you know, the hidden Sydney 
there's so much of that kind of yeah. grassroots generated yes. storytelling about the, the city. Cool stuff. So yeah. it's it's about connecting that through yeah. into the more formal processes. That's the challenge, I think. Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah the well, formal one of many. A problem, <laughs> <isn't it? laughs> um, all right. Uh, so Lindell. Um, now Lindell has done an astonishing thing in Vietnam. Uh, uh, she did her PhD here at Sydney, but in Ho Chi Minh City she has <laughs> achieved this extraordinary thing of producing, finding a way of producing food, growing food, uh, which is green stuff, I suppose, vegetables principally, and fruit, um, in a way that is pesticide-free in the country that has the highest pesticide-induced cancer rate in the world, I think I'm right in saying, um, and also zero, net zero carbon, um, and also cheap. It sells, or at least it's produced for one US dollar, I'm sure Linda will correct me if I get this fact wrong, one US dollar a kilo, which yep. is astonishing. Uh, so it makes very high quality food, cheaply available for everyone for the first time, at the same time as it uh, obviates the use of flood, dangerous floodplains, given climate change like the Mekong Delta, for food growing. So it's... Um, it's an extraordinary thing and uh, rather under-celebrated, I think, at the moment, although Lindor might tell you... I just wanted to summarise that for you. That actually is worth a PhD in itself, that whole thing. But I want to ask Lindor um, to move forward into her next project, which is in Sydney, and just tell us about what she might do here. Thanks, Elizabeth. Um, so one of <clears throat> our first speaker here, Michael, said the couch is the enemy. And I really think that energy is the enemy, OK? Because um, energy has just become such a luxury. And if you're trying to create food at affordable prices so that everybody can just get their basic, you know, what should be a fairly basic part of life, when you start to run... And our food supply chains have just become energy supply chains. And so when you have something that is a luxury like energy, and I'm not being dramatic, right, there are plenty of people who cannot afford their energy bills, but you have inserted that or embedded that through every part of the food supply chain system, from the glass houses to management of climate to the grow substrate to the fertilisers to the, to the water pumps and to everything. So six years ago we went to Vietnam with an idea. We couldn't get funded in Australia, which is the classic story. Um, but we went to Vietnam with this idea and uh, we end up creating what is now known by the Dutch, by, by the bi biggest horticultural companies in the world as probably the most efficient food supply or food production system in the world. Total net zero and um, circular economy. No landfill and about 1% of the energy of our competition. The point out of that now is, so we're moving, once we've, of course, we've proved this in Vietnam and we're in all the major supermarkets plus in about the top 500 hotels. So it's not poor quality food, it is the most incredible food these chefs have ever had. So then we thought we've got to go back to Australia and, and um, do it there. So we're doing a, a gigantic project in, in Western Sydney and our objective is to replicate what we do in Vietnam back here. Um, it's a fantastic project that now includes Western Sydney University, RMIT, and um, potentially in future our partner in delivering part of this will be Oz Harvest. Um, but basically we will have the most intensive, sustainably intensive, energy efficient, low cost affordable um, food production system um, sitting on the outskirts or, you know, in Sydney. Mm. And... Um, you know, that, thank you very much, um, that should take food back to being what it should be, right? On the supermarket shelves and like, like we go to the supermarket and we can afford to pay for food. And the other thing there is that people talk to me about, oh, well, we've got a system and it's indoor agriculture, but it uses renewable energy. Well, it doesn't matter if it's renewable or if it's coal, it's still 20 cents a kilowatt hour or whatever you're paying, right? So you put 10 of those into a kilogram of food. So the whole idea is energy is the enemy. <laughs> And we've, you know, we're proving that now in, in Western Sydney, certainly. And, um, you know, hopefully in, in other places, as you anticipate. <laughs> so one of the things that interests me about this, um, which some people might think is slightly sideways to city making, is, uh, you know, how it might impact um, the pattern of Sydney and how we 
uh, adjust or recreate that pattern into the future and whether, for example, it can be done to encourage uh, little localised villages or sort of towns or pockets of energy as other people have been talking about and whether it might be um, doable on rooftops or warehouses or you know, you know, spare space around the place. So we are currently working with Singapore in, and we don't know whether we'll go to Singapore yet, but uh, there's certainly a big call for that for us to go there um, with their food security issues. But the Singapore has a lot of what's called HDB flats, which are Singapore government owns all of the land and the Housing Development Board flats. Mm. So they own all the rooftops. So there's the potential for us to go there and use this system there. Mm. The same thing could happen here in Sydney, but the one thing that we've learnt, because I deal mostly, unfortunately, with the finance world these days, um, is, and the whole world runs on capital efficiency, okay? So um, you'd need to have a couple of different ways of thinking and to have offtake agreements with, for example, the big supermarkets, or that it doesn't all just end up in their one distribution centre and then a truck goes out, you know? And so there's a certain layer of logistics and finance and planning that you'd have to have on board to make that possible. And um, one thing I know with our technology is that anything's possible. Um, it's the rules and regulations that we have to play with. Mm. Most of the time we don't worry about the rules, we just do our own thing. But um, <laughs> Australians are a bit more, you know, <laughs> get a bit cranky. <laughs> That's why we went to Vietnam, because there are no rules. Yeah. Australia needs to loosen up, yeah. <laughs> That's how we built the technology. We thought there are no rules, like let's make this work. <laughs> That's great. So that also connects quite neatly to my question for Michelle uh, Leishman, which is, um, I know your kind of your life really is dedicated to urban greening, which is great because it has all the benefits that we know about. It lowers urban temperature, absorbs carbon, um, enhances amenity, and, and so on. And yet, I think for many people, the idea of greening cities still. Uh, implies sort of big backyards, um, bush suburbs and open spaces, so which is sort of co running contrary to density and ha um, stands at least potentially to take us straight back to car dependent sprawl. So, uh, so I suppose my question is really, are uh, really intense urban greening and density compatible in your view? Yeah, so, uh, so we talk about the urban forest uh, within cities and we mean everything. So we mean everything from the remnant vegetation uh, to streetscapes to people's residential gardens to parks and gardens to golf courses, you know, the whole kit and, kit and caboodle or whatever. Um, so, so I think what I would like, you know, if you were throwing me the challenge of saving Sydney, <laughs> it would obviously be green. Uh, but it would be about creating nature, a nature-rich, livable city. Mm. Uh, and I think that's kind of the bit that people forget about. They think green, but it's not just grass and extensive spaces. It's, it's nature-richness, which is really important. Um, so, so that would be my solution to saving Sydney, would be nature-richness. So um, Mike talked about the topography of Sydney. So we start off with a great backbone, if you like, or a great foundation in that Sydney is a fantastic location in terms of, you know, we have national parks to the, the north, the south, the west. We have uh, beautiful waterways. We have our um, harbour and ocean. So we've got this amazing framework to start with. And then it's a matter of using that, designing, you know, the urban planners here <laughs> to design our cities based on the topography and based on the natural assets that we already have. So, so that's key, is, is um, using that as the framework for um, building nature-rich uh, locations where we want to be, whether they're the pocket parks, whether they're extensive fields, whether they're streetscapes, whatever they are. So, um, and, and like Elizabeth said, they offer, you know, the green space is providing us with all of these benefits. Uh, so, that, so for people to understand what the benefits are, so that we stop, to think, we stop thinking about green space as a liability, as a cost, as something that we have to manage as expensive and, you know, we have to, you know, sweep the gutters and all of that sort of stuff. But to think about it as the asset and understanding what it provides for us. So it's providing uh, cooling with extreme climate as, the, as we go get further and further into global warming. Uh, it helps us, you know, with air pollution. It's managing our stormwater. 
uh, it's providing biodiversity, of course, as well. So um, all of these things are, uh, you know, we need to kind of shift the conversation to thinking about urban green space as being valuable, to being an asset that we manage. And um, so, you know, so how do we do that, mm -hmm. basically? How do we find the governance and the financial levers? And, and one of the ways is, so I, you know, I'll put this slide up. Uh, so what does it make you feel like? When you look at the images on the left, I'll tell you that when I look at the images on the left, my blood pressure goes up <laughs> and I feel anxious, right? My keep fit's probably telling you my heart rate would be racing. But when I look at the images on the left, uh, that energy, that anxiety subsides, right? So what we found out in COVID was how important our green space is to our mental health. So it's not just about the physical space of being out there and being able to exercise and that's all great for our cardio fitness and everything. But the surprise, surprise, it's incredibly important for our mental health too. So finding ways that we can help people understand all of the benefits of urban green space, whether it's whether you live in the inner city or you live in the outer suburbs, we can use green space in different ways, all the benefits that it provides, but then we need to find the governance and the financial levers to make it work. And, and I think that's, that's the huge challenge for us. Yeah. <laughs> Not to mention uh, persuading the politicians yep. of those values. Um, so, Philip, <laughs> um, I think of you as kind of Mr. Public Sydney in many ways, um, because you've spent a lifetime analysing, not quite a lifetime, um, teaching, drawing, you know, designing, writing about and helping to govern the complex lacework that is Sydney's public spaces. You've also uh, argued that to limit Sydney's overall footprint, uh, in effect to create a city wall or a city boundary beyond which, you know, not. Um, but the, it seems to me that the habit in Sydney when space particularly when sort of push comes to shove and space becomes contested, is to, is to uh, deprioritise public space, and in particular, of course, green space, and, and devote it instead to casinos, <laughs> for example. Um, so we have parks becoming stadiums, streets getting built over, and so on. Um, how do you think we need to govern this public-private balance thing in Sydney? Um, well, I think we need to have a much richer conception of the city. So I would say that we're living in the era of the great privatisation. Certainly you can say with confidence it was well underway in 2011, but really it started in the 1980s and it's sort of um, obviously overlaps with neoliberalism and um, you know, Thatcher and Reagan and the like, but in fact there's homegrown versions of it. And I think when you look at the growth of Sydney, it's really, to coin a phrase, rooted in development and real estate interests. Because that is the agenda that's always put. Mm -hmm. And when you look around the inner city, for example, you know, let's look at Barangaroo, which you've mentioned, unsolicited proposals. I mean, actually, where is the public agenda at Barangaroo? I've seen, certainly, the complete erosion of public space. Every street's got a car park underneath it. The casinos hog the foreshore. Um, there's this thing which I call the cultural void at the end, which is sandwiched between a car park and a, a fake headland, and they <laughs> still don't know what to do with it 10 years later. You look at Darling Harbour, which was actually built as a public project in the 80s, but actually has been re uh, demolished, and you'll be demolishing it again in 30 years' time, um, actually as a private project. You look at the fish markets in Blackwattle Bay, uh, you look at White Bay across the water, you look at Central, um, you look at North Everly, uh, you and you look at Waterloo Metro, the agenda is always real estate. So what public elements are brought to those places, even at uh, opposite White Bay, Blackwater Bay, the fish markets is actually a commercial entity. $729 million worth of commercial entity. The football stadium even is thought about as a venue for rugby league. And I remember James Warwick saying that New South Wales, the rugby league state, that's sort of an awful, awful culture. <laughs> But it's not just the city centre. You look, you look more broadly, you think of the, um, this great sell-off of public housing. You look at Sirius, you look at particularly Millers Point, you look at what's th actually happening by subterfuge in Glebe. Um, the threats to uh, Woolloomooloo were uh, raised the other day. Um, certainly the Waterloo estate. 
you know, where it's going to be, you know, half of it flattened and, what, 28 extra dwellings, uh, public housing dwellings, um, when you're going to get 6,000. But you can look further afield. You can look at Count of Cumberland Hospital. You can look at all the metro lines, which are sort of the uh, Trojan horses of development in a way, rather than being thought of as a public agenda which is enriching and connecting the city, they're actually thought of as development opportunities and conceived as that by New South Wales Treasury, and we've got to point the finger at economists, not just planet. But when you think about all those metro stations, you know, what, what theatres are proposed? You know, what, what venues? Where's there a library in one of those places? Where's there a pool? You can certainly point at those things being put into Green Square. And you can look at the whole necklace of public elements that have been put into Green Square, all funded by city, $1.2 billion worth of public space and public facilities. But that whole equation is lacking, not just in Sydney, I'd say across Australia. And so I really call that a lack of public imagination. There is no ability for government to actually conceive of public goods conceive of uh, urban green space, conceive of a better way of doing it, conceive of a local economy, conceive of, in fact, I was in Harris Park last night. I mean, that sort of happened despite everything. Yeah. And it's absolutely yeah. amazing. And it sort of can't be instituted. It's a sort of the genuine dynamic of the city and the developers always claim that they are the dynamic of the city and they're not. And what we've really lost is public agency to support the city and we need to get it back. How do we hit it? Yeah, yeah. Um, that seems like a very good moment to uh, invite questions from the audience. Um, do I have a question? Yes. There's a mic here. So in my professional life, I've made a lot of the assumptions that some of you have stated um, to be obvious truths. So for example, that culture and street life um, in the dark is a good thing, that urban greening is a good thing. Um, when I have very informally polled my parents who are from a diverse background, if you were to ask them the same question about those four images and said, what do you think of the top left image? They would say, it looks tidy, it looks like an orderly place to live. And yet when they come and visit me in the suburb that I live in now, they're always marvelling at the street art, at the free, you know, whatever, the street libraries. And they can't seem to connect the dots about what makes a wonderful, vibrant place to live and what in their image is the city that they want to live in. So my question to everyone is, how are we bringing everyone along in Sydney, not just the educated elite of whom I am one, along so that we are all on the same page about the kind of city that we want to live in and we're not just kicking and screaming in our books, on our blogs, in our festivals. <laughs> who, who feels like that's a question for well, I can definitely identify Michael with probably. that because uh, the um, journey that, immigrant journey that I, I came on is exactly that. And in fact, I think one of those photos may have been taken from the area which my parents uh, bought land in and have now you know, developed and put that and I have the same uh, um, tension, um, which is why I've kind of thrown it away and gone after something else, really. And I, I, but it's it's hard, isn't it? Because um, you know, right, right now we've got uh, Afghan um, refugee uh, influx, and it's easy to sit in this room and talk about the matters that we're talking about, and then think very. It's a very different situation when you're fighting for survival and thinking about you know your mm. future generations and how they can be educated so that they can have the opportunity that they probably did have in Afghanistan but now don't have now, it's been removed from them. And so I, um, I, uh, I, I don't have an answer to that particular um, um, challenge, but it's, it's, it's very much the, the, um, the, the right one to ask, I think. Um, and <laughs> as Elizabeth said right at the beginning, is, is there only so much land though? You know, I don't know, we seem to keep being able to, to find more of it. Um, but. It's a, it's a very sprawling metropolitan area and I kind of, you know, I don't really have strong views that I can publicly say as I'm a public servant now on, on, on some of these matters, but you would hope that some of those challenges that um, Philip just identified about cultural space being, um, you know, Trojan horse into the Trojan horse of the transport system um, gives people an alternative and I think that that's the, the thing that, you know, if you look at migration patterns from India now, in particular, India and China, by far um, the greatest influx. Um, 
and the living conditions and uh, ability for people to live in small spaces in, in those areas. Definitely my mum came from Mumbai, which is 20 million people crammed into a peninsula. Um, you know, this, the, the, is there a moment now to go, well, actually, bring all these things together and Lyndall, your uh, observation on Singapore in terms of um, its food security issues is really, really going to sharpen the lens on it. So, uh, again, I don't, know the, I don't know the answer, but it's a very good question. My view would be demonstration. Like, it's so difficult, isn't it, to articulate the, the joy and the magic. I mean, who would have thought 20 years ago that street libraries were a cool thing? Like, if you just said that and pitched it to government, they'd just be like, mm, what's this? But it's risen from the ground from community and now it's all, all of a sudden a great thing. You know, I'm assuming you're probably living in the Inner West somewhere. I mean, the street art wasn't there until Inner West Council funded the Perfect Match program and just went, we're doing it. You know, so it's like, I feel like this is where the overburdens, like, regulation is a prohibitor to our cultural identity here because for, for years our whole life has been shaped by regulation as opposed to regulation serving the will of the people in Australia. And so you really just need to create a fabric and a platform for people to be enabled to create the joy because really then it's undeniable when you live and walk and work through it <laughs> that it's yeah. great and fun and awesome, you know? Yeah. Like, but you can never prescribe that stuff. And this is the problem with this top-down exercise around yeah. building precincts or creating community. It doesn't work because the best communities come from an organic growth. And so really as policymakers and anyone who has the ability to leverage any levers in government, it should be just about creating a sense of in, an enabling culture where we're not adverse to risk. Be, <laughs> because otherwise we don't know what the next great thing is going to be, whether it's a fantastic solution to growing food or whether it is, you know, street libraries or an amazing festival or a fantastic precinct. Yeah, and I think there's also a bit of a threat actually through a lot of the talks, which is, I think, actually sympathetic to a view of the city that's diverse, that's unpretentious, that's the vernacular, that's actually the local experience rather than an elite educated view of what we ought to do. So I think there is actually a kind of commonality across what a lot of us are saying here. The challenge is, I think, actually these questions of process. It's about, I mean, this is the ultimate real estate city, right? <laughs> I mean, it mm. is really. But it can be something different to that. It is something different to that already. Um, so it is about that organic complexity, the everyday experience. I too grew up in, I grew up in one of those suburban housing estates in Western Sydney. And you know, you went looking for joy as a teenager in that kind of environment, but you could find it. You could find it down the creeks with the yabbies. You could find it at the BMX track out the back. Um, you found ways to form bands and garages and four bedroom boring houses. So those things can and, and are and will be done, um, but it's about the, the extent to which that kind of vibrancy, that kind of vernacular is brought into a conversation about the city. And that, there are difficult questions, I think, about process and about power mm. in this city, and that's the real issue, actually. Yes, and, and also I think about housing provision. We haven't talked about the obvious bleeping red issue of affordable housing, but if you could imagine uh, a way of building houses that wasn't developer-led that was actually about people being able to be involved in city making um, for themselves in some way, then possibly some of this stuff could start to happen organically. Anyway, um, are there more questions? I'm sure there are more questions from the audience. Yeah. Um, thanks very much to everyone so far. It's such a great discussion. Um, my question is around circular cities. So I'm wondering if, if you have... Um, uh, what your vision is of how we can enable more circularity, particularly of all the stuff in all the households. Um, we've got council cleanup in my street coming up. So again, you know, everyone's reminded of how much useful stuff um, it's really hard to find a new home for. Just wondering if anyone had any um, great vision on that. Thank you. Lyndall, maybe? Um, so I'm, I'm not sure... Look, what we do in Vietnam, against all odds, right, is we do exactly that. So, and, but not in terms of the entire, everything in your house. What I'm talking about specifically is the food supply chain. But what we have developed, and because I, I hear a lot, you know, the last, the last question, I'll just kind of go back to a little bit, 
What I find is that um, there is so much capital involved in these things and governments come in and then it's really hard to change course, right? But we, and you know, because there's so much infrastructure and there's so much legacy investment and so much, so much. So for us, going to Vietnam was all about, <clears throat> we just basically had a blank canvas to go and be two crazy women building this new technology. And we developed this complete circular economy around that. And, and it works and it's functional and it's now built into a system and it's operational and every supermarket is our customer, right? There's success. I think it's really super, super easy to build these things, but you just need to actually start with a demo and then start building out. And before we even think, I th this is the way I think, about moving that like behemoth, that bureaucracy that is government, just the people have got to do it and they've got to demonstrate it and then it'll mm -hmm. start working. And my classic, like last two weeks ago, I was in a Oz Harvest van and I just thought, like I know Ronnie's taken forever to build this gigantic organisation and it's so fantastic, but Jesus, that's just real work, you know? Like yeah. that works. And if, why didn't the government step in and do that, mm. right? Yeah. No, 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 yeah. Ronnie Khan had to go around like, oh, yeah. until yeah. everybody said, okay, we'll give this a go. And then all of a sudden the people made it work. The government is not going to do this. And the same thing is, you know what? The food supply chain has been going down this path of micro evolutions for the last 50 years in hydroponics and we just went, we're going to step right back and completely redesign the whole system. And then we're going to prove that it works. Um, you know, and now governments are like, oh my God, this can be done. And so you've just got to, you've got to do things work and you can never rely on the government because, um, <laughs> yeah, I'm not making many friends, I guess, with the government. <laughs> <laughs> Do I hope there aren't many here. Do you think it depends on, on um, like a level of desperation or need or maybe poverty? Like, are we too rich and complacent to be bothered? With Look, I, th that? I think we, we're just going to have to get there. So, yeah. you know, I lecture at, on climate change and energy, something like, I don't know what the stats are, 2% two, two of the land is cities. They're responsible for 80% of energy use. They're responsible mm -hmm. for 70% of food waste. They're responsible for 60% of, you know, mm -hmm. building waste or probably more. We have to move to a circular economy. Mm -hmm. for, and, you know, we have to solve the energy crisis. And the only way that we can do that is to move to the circular economy. But uh, we're too slow. Too slow. But I think now, like I, we left Australia because we applied for six government grants mm. and we couldn't get them because this was not going to work, right? And so we're now over there and literally, I uh, investment in all our, the people that we talk to, it's tens of, so it's so much money. But we are now coming back because there are things in place which are going to start to drive these decisions, right? So we're starting to work towards credits for landfill yeah. avoidance and stuff yeah. like that. Yeah. And that's not something that, like, we're 20 years too late as far as I'm concerned, right? Um, and I'm a fourth generation coal miner, so I'm allowed to say whatever I want. <laughs> but um, the point is that there are now the levers that are getting into place to help these things move along. But it's, yeah. Slow. It's, but you, yep. And you just got to, the other thing you've got to demonstrate is profitability, right? Mm. And so that's where all are just, these fantastic margins, so everybody wants to know us, the investors now and stuff, um, because we, we actually got to tell them just, we don't talk about the do good part of it anymore, because honestly, nobody cares. The financiers just don't care. So we just say, oh, this is our metrics, and they go, fantastic, and we go, oh, and by the way, and then they're like, mm. oh, yeah, right. <laughs> Sorry, is there, there another question here? Yes. Hello, this is really a question for Philip Ballas, and please everybody else join in, but Barangaroo broke my heart. Your original plan was phenomenal. I'm sure there were great things, to, more things to be had out of it, but it didn't happen. Um, Black Water Bay and the fish markets, it's all happening. And now we've got Bays West happening. You know, I, I can just see the same thing happening again and again with no, it's getting worse, not better. Um, how do we take our agency back? Voting isn't enough, you know, and Protests aren't enough, and pro petitions aren't enough. We need to do, we have a lot more. Yeah, I don't know. Well, well, that's why I said it's really a question of imagination, and I think that's what we've really been lacking. Uh, clearly, I think grassroots community 
of course we need all of that. Um, its lack of effectiveness is really concerning. Um, you know, my first job was uh, on Darling Harbour, working on the original, and we could see it was terrible. We did John over there, um, and um, you know we left and formed the anti-monorail group. So you know, but there we lost the battle but won the war. And I think you've got to take a long-term view of cities. Cities teach you to look at the long term. I remember at that time I was really quite depressed about being in Sydney. I just thought everything was bad, and I went and did a masters in Paris, and you saw a much longer view of the city. Um, this, this period of repatience will pass. You've always got to have an attitude of optimism and you've always got to advocate for all of the progressive things you can find and you've got to talk to everybody you know and you've got to be as forceful as you can at every opportunity and that's why we're all here. <laughs> <laughs> and um, you just can't give up and you can't, um, you know, we only get one planet. Uh, cities are actually the coal face, literally, um, of all of these problems, social as well as environmental, we have to fix cities all around the world. I think too um, uh, that it is starting to change. I mean, maybe not fast enough, but I do think that for the first time, planning issues, development stuff is hitting the front pages. People are concerned and community groups, I know most of them feel disempowered, but there, there's a lot of anger out there, and sooner or later it must become a real voting issue, I think. Um, sorry. Oh, Chris, oh, here's me. Yeah, I was just going to follow up, but I think you're absolutely right. And um, for me, let's think about the federal election that just happened, right? That mm. was one and lost on many issues, but uh, it was certainly about integrity, and it was certainly about how decisions are made by government. And you know, we saw the Teal Independence really change the nature of that election mm. because they were seen to represent people who had genuine community concerns and they wanted to really bring that to Parliament. And I think that this, this is the moment, actually, mm. at state level yeah. and local councils and so forth. We need that transparency in decision making in, in planning. So I think it, it is actually, a, it's not about planners the enemy here. I th it's about planners being empowered to make decisions that are actually on behalf of the communities that they are employed to represent. Um, but there is a process problem here. But there's a moment, I think, of transparency. There's a kind of zeitgeist for that, actually. So we should seize that. I'm, I agree with both Philip and with, mm. um, with Elizabeth on that. Imagine if you had a planning act that made the public interest at central plan. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> that would be a shock. It's section 79C, actually, <laughs> of the act. That it's, is, um, that, is there uh, one more quick question <laughs> before I... Thank you. Um, I'm interested in the panel's view on our current system of land zoning. Um, so I think the system really is that a local environmental plan can say, you know, this is where you live, this is where you work, this is where you're educated, this is where you can farm, which obviously you don't want, you know, an industrial power plant in the middle of a residential area, but it's always struck me as a little bit artificial for a planner to try and dictate um, how people can live their lives in that much detail. So my question is really, do you think it's worth in the interests of urban vibrancy for our planning system to be a, bit, a little bit less prescriptive? Or do you think perhaps that any loosening would immediately be taken advantage of by developers? Do you want to have a go at that one? Well, <laughs> you probably, there's a couple of us will have views on that. Yeah, um, yeah. There's a paradox. If you don't zone, then it's a free-for-all and it will be a free-for-all. Yeah. So you need yeah. to have zoning that legislates for allowable activities in areas to enable things to happen in those places. So with industrial space, for example, it needs to be dirty, it needs to be noisy, it needs to have a degree of flexibility, you need to hack it as an in inhabitant of an industrial space. It's very different from the old days of the big mass manufacturing you know, factories. Those spaces are about accommodating a diverse range of eclectic activities the zoning helps protect that, ironically. So it's a bit of a paradox. You actually need a degree of rigidity, but at the same time, absolutely, we have a crazy kind of system where we just pocket off bits of the city and we, we label it on a map and that, that sort of forever determines what the activity is. My big idea, really, is actually we need publicly owned cheap space for yes. communities. <laughs> That's community run. And it might be a green initiatives, it might be green space, it might be creative space venues, it might be whatever the needs of a suburban community are, bicycle workshops uh, for kids, whatever it is. Unless you have 
a zoning system and and some kind of bulwark against the real estate industry in this city, you're not going to get that. And I think for me, that's it's, zoning is actually a part of the story there about what you need to protect that. Yeah, it has to be safeguarded public owned assets and it has to be for all of community use. I think um, uh, this is a big pet one of mine. Um, <laughs> yes, they need to be there, but it needs to be less prescribed and rigid. The way the future is mixed use. I mean, no one's single business is a single use thing anymore. So, and also, especially if you're looking at a creative environment where you've got, um, you know, unaffordable housing, where creatives being pushed out of cities, you have to be able to have a work, live space and an environment, we need to have more mixed use space. But then some sorts of prescription are great. I mean, you look at the new entertainment precinct legislation, which is embedding arts and cultural use into the land use that says to people, this is expected here and this is now safeguarded. So if you're going to develop in this area, you can't close down a venue now. I mean, those things are great. But I think um, the issue that we've had, particularly in New South Wales, is that it's, it's been skewed to the other side for too long. And we haven't used those same levers to protect all the valuable things that we love, like industrial creative space or a venue or whatever, you know, green, green space, space, whatever it is that is important to community. So somehow you have to have the flexibility, but there are some places where you don't want flexibility. So we can't knock down Cumberland Plain Woodland and then get it back again. Yeah. Once it's gone, it's gone. And we have to use, there are some parts of the landscape that we have to use for what they should be used for, our waterways and our mm. conservation areas and things like that. And there are other places that it's okay. You can flick between and you can be flexible. So, yep, I would, would never want to li see the lifting of protection on, you know, important conservation areas in particular. Uh, I think I'm going to stop at that there, just because we've got two minutes or something left. I'm going to ask everybody to, if they might summarise in ten words or less, um, <laughs> if they had, if they could do one thing, two or four Sydney for the next 50 years, say, 20, I don't know, uh, what would it be if you, if you could have one wish? Uh, I think in the context of the discussion, uh, um, conveying in go within government, as a champion within government, the value of social connection and having that factor into treasury calculations. Mm. <laughs> mm. yes. You do that, I, for us, <laughs> do that. in yes. your time. Um, mine would be, I would love to see the removal of assumption of risk. Um, especially for our sector, anytime anyone tries to do anything, there's an assumption that it's going to be high risk. Mm. So then people are prohibited from doing anything mm. and they have to prove themselves. Let's just give them all the benefits from the beginning mm. and take them away if they do the wrong thing. <laughs> yeah, presumption of innocence. Yeah. Actually. Mm. I've already blown my chance to say yeah. <laughs> free yeah. community, publicly owned community run space. Yeah, you've had yours. <laughs> <laughs> what about music? Would you do something with music? Look, I mean, sure. We need lots more rehearsal studios. That's, mm. There's no doubt about that. And again, they need to be cheap because mus mm. museos don't really make any money. Mm. Um, and look, music certainly connects communities in really unique ways. But I think it's more than mm. just creative space. It's about, it's about the circular economy. Those, you know, if those flexible spaces mm. that are cheap, publicly owned, mm. give the option to be able to start up small circular initiatives and so forth. You're not going to get off the ground because they're not profitable because the space is expensive to start with. Yeah. Somehow you need a circuit breaker to that, yes. that real estate kind of frenzy. Yeah. That's the key thing. Cultural change in Sydney. Yep. Uh, <laughs> Lindahl. OK, so I think climate change is going to be the biggest destroyer of wealth. Uh, and we're already seeing it. And uh, what I think is that the discussion today, it's only going to get really much, much harder with governments trying to do, they will have to do a lot more, looking after climate change catastrophes, et cetera, and then still provide all of these services. And so the competition for that dollar is going to get even bigger. And so we need to come up with entire new business models uh, as to ha and make them profitable as to how we start to run the cities mm. again, instead of relying on the government. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> Sounds good. Um, Michelle. <coughs> Uh, so, for me, it's about um, building and delivering on the vision of a, of a nature-rich, uh, livable city, uh, that Sydney could be the global leader. Uh, you know, we like to win competitions, that, we could, that would be a good competition to win. Um, but, and, and embedded in that is to get the balance right between 
the public and the common good versus the, the private benefit. And that's, and green space always loses there. And so we, that's the bit that we need to get right. And we need yeah. the governance and the financial levers to make it work. And climate change is going to speed that one up for us. So, yeah. mm. Philip. Um, I was struck by the French architects, um, Lacaton and Vassal, who were here recently. And they said, um, they talked about Sydney as a ghetto for the rich. And so I think affordability is our biggest challenge and inclusiveness, diversity, um, not just for where you live, but where you work, venues, um, where you uh, grow gardens and the like. So I think, and, and I actually think zoning is an enemy of that because it, it promotes monocultures. So I think we need diversity, 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 affordability, affordability. affordability. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Excellent. Well, look, thank you, everybody, and thank you to the audience and our online audience for joining us today. I'm going to have to stop everything there and encourage everybody um, to attend other Festival of Urbanism uh, events and panels and also to check out. There's a special Festival of Urbanism book series by the City Road podcast, which is worth checking out with details on the website. So, um, And also, I'd like to invite everyone to continue the conversation, which sounds to me like it's just beginning, actually, over a drink um, and perhaps something to nibble. Thank you, everybody. Thank you to the panel in particular. <laughs>